I have been sensing in my spirit that um, today's service, if we will cooperate with God, is going to be different than your typical morning worship service. And I, I emphasize the importance of cooperating with God because we've been speaking on a series of God Speak. And it's one thing to hear what God is saying. It is another thing to respond to what God is saying. And as you know, a few weeks ago, I spoke on the subject of God speak. And at the end of the message, I ask you to write down on the back of your fill-in-the-blank page the things that God was speaking to you during the following week and place them in my mailbox. And Many of you did just that, and I want to take just a few moments today to read just a few of those as we begin. The first is from a couple that were visiting our church from South Carolina. Received a very nice note from them, and they also sent a a check. Their names are Rosalind and Bernie Grossman. Bernie and I wanted to let you know how much we thoroughly enjoyed and were inspired by your message, God Speak. Interestingly enough, it is a similar message that I am studying in Bible study, Living in God's Kingdom, which I shared with our ladies on Tuesday. Quieting our minds and being still to hear God. Also, Roy and Carolyn were great ambassadors in greeting us. We did not have our checkbook with us and wanted to give a little bit more. We love the area and we will be back. Blessings to you and your family at HFA. P.S., Thank you for praying for South Carolina. It was uplifting to see the prayer request in the bulletin. Rosalind and Bernie Grossman, Lexington, South Carolina. I received probably close to 25 at this point, and I encourage you, if you have not yet done so, go ahead and take this week. What is God speaking to you? What's God trying to say? What... What is it that he's trying to get your attention on? And listen to it and journal it. This is what one individual wrote. It said, I feel as though God was telling me to stop dwelling on the past and look toward the future. God can take me to places I never dreamed of traveling. Bad choices leads to bad consequences. Pray for God to give me wisdom. I've lost a lot of things, house, cars, family members, pride and respect, but I haven't lost eternal life, and that is the true reward. Can you say amen to that? Another individual wrote the following, said, Pastor Jeff, you ask us to be still and to listen to God this week. Well, it was a lot harder than I ever imagined. I never realized my mind runs a mile a minute like my mouth. (laughs) I can identify with that. It took all week to finally get this down. On Thursday, I read something that made me look at finding pennies on the ground differently. It was a story about a rich man who invited his worker to dinner. The worker's wife was nervous about going because the man had a lot of money. They were walking into the restaurant when the rich man, looking down, found a penny. He picked it up and stopped for a moment, then put it in his pocket. Later that night, the lady couldn't take it anymore because she thought, he's rich. Why did he pick that penny up? So the next day, she asked him. He said on the penny, it states, in God we trust. He told her that every time I find a penny, it's God's way of telling me, trust in me. So I say a prayer and put it in my pocket. So Friday morning when I was coming out of Food Lion, right on the ground, I looked down and found not one penny, but two. And I finally got what God's been trying to tell me. Do not worry. Trust in me. I've been stressed about everything lately. Am I a good enough Christian? Am I doing enough when it comes to working for him in the church? Am I good enough altogether? When are more jobs going to come my way? Will my knee ever heal so I can get back to exercising? And I could go on and on. Also, he gave me a verse this week, Matthew 28, 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Boy, was he ever clear. Trust in me. Sometimes we think we can't hear him when he's telling us things, but it's us that are not listening. Well, he sure made this loud and clear to me this week. 
Thanks for the lesson, very eye-opening for me. Those are just a few. But I want you to know as your pastor, I'm encouraged when I read these because it allows me to know that God is speaking to you the same that he's speaking to me. And I believe that loud and clearly, God is telling me to take more time to spend in his presence, to take more time to shut out the clamor and the noise and the chaos and all the things that rob me of time with him and understand that his return is imminent, much nearer than what most of us realize. If I were to ask you today, do you believe that the Lord is coming soon? I'm, I'm sure that every hand in this place would go up. But I ask you, how has that affected your life? What are you doing differently in knowing that Christ could come back at any second, at any moment? Things that I've been putting off as far as living a more godly life. Things that I've been putting off as far as being a more fervent witness for Christ. Things that I've been putting off as far as making God number one priority in my life. Is that taking center stage? Is that front and central? Or is it something that, you know, well, I'll get around to it one day. But I would challenge you today that if we really believe that Christ is going to return at any moment, there ought to be some change taking place in my life, change taking place in your life as well. So with the help of the Holy Spirit this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject of keeping close, listening to the Lord. Keeping close, listening to the Lord. You know, when you begin reading the Bible, in the book of Genesis, you'll discover that it records the story of God creating humanity or God creating man there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. God took a deep breath and exhaled into man's nostrils and infused the first man, Adam, with life. To Adam, the first human being, God gave a breath of life, a breath with a spark of divinity. In the original meaning, there is a sense of intimacy that is indicated here. Several years ago, when I was a lot younger, I was a lifeguard. And part of my training as a lifeguard, I was required to learn CPR. I learned rather quickly that to help give life back to someone else, you had to get pretty intimate, face to face, mouth to mouth, giving my breath to someone else. While I've never had to give CPR in real life, we all were required to practice on a doll by the name of Annie until our instructor was satisfied that we had mastered the technique of CPR. But you know, it's interesting that when you read here in the account in Genesis, when God created man, he did not create him from a distance, but rather he created man different from anything else that he had created up to that point in time. He desired to have daily fellowship with him. And when we look at scripture, we learn some wonderful things about God. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bible or pay attention to the PowerPoint here behind me. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, there's a very interesting verse. God is speaking to his prophet Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is penning these words down so that later he might share them with the people of Judah who have been carried away into captivity by Babylon. And you'll notice it says, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me, what? With all your heart. You see, that, that's a challenge. Because there are a lot of people who are seeking for God, but they're not doing it wholeheartedly. They're doing it partially. They're doing it when it's convenient. They're doing it when they're in crisis. They're doing it at times that, you know, it, it suits them. But when I seek for God with all of my heart, that means that God has all of me and not just part of me. That God has not only part of me, but he has all of me at all times and not just part of the time. Not just when it's convenient, not just when it suits me, but rather he is the love of my life. He is my reason for getting out of bed in the morning. He is my reason for living my day. He is my reason for existing in fellowshipping with him is where I find my true heart's content and my reason for living and desiring God with all of my heart. 
So we want to look today at the subject of keeping close, listening to the Lord. Would you bow your head with me in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, would you honor me today by speaking through me? Would you allow me to be your mouthpiece, Lord, and even though it's my mouth and my words, my voice, allow me to be your spokesperson? Holy Spirit, I am so dependent upon you. I I need you to go before me. I need you to anoint me. I pray that as your word goes forth, that it will accomplish in hearts and lives what needs to take place because, Lord, I, I believe that you're speaking. I believe that there are those who are listening and may we all listen today as you speak. But then, as we have opportunity to respond, I pray there'll be no more hesitancy, there'll be no more reluctancy, there'll be no more embarrassment or whatever reason it is that is keeping us, Lord, from surrendering our all to you today. May we experience that spiritual breakthrough that I believe that you're wanting to do and be responsive. You've already spoken to us, God. You've already shared that you want us to be completely surrendered, completely available. I need you, Lord. Anoint afresh and anew. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When we look at Scripture, what are some of the things that we discover about the Lord? Well, first and foremost, I believe that from the very beginning, it's really obvious that God desires intimacy with each and every one of us. God desires to have a close and intimate, a personal relationship with each and every one of us. It's imperative that we understand that the deeper your personal relationship with God is, the more the devil becomes fearful of us. Because you see, quite simply stated, my friend, you cannot spend time in the presence of God without acquiring his characteristics, without discovering that his ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And there's a desire on your part to become more godly, less of you and more of him. And when we become more like Christ and are perfected in the image of Christ, Satan gets fearful because he remembers the fact he was defeated by this Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And now you and I are children of the Most High God. The same spirit that raised him from the dead dwells in you and that makes all of hell tremble. Christianity is not about a weekly trip to church. You and I must go beyond that. And and hear me this morning, my friend. It's not about how often you are in church. It is rather what is taking place while you're there. Is it something that I take with me out of the church building, after the church service is over, after the last song has been sung, after the last prayer has been offered up? Is it something that I've had an encounter with God that is going to speak to me on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, on Saturday, that when I come back again to the house of the Lord, whether it be Wednesday evening, or whether it be on Monday to EE, or whether it be on Thursday to, to uh, the young adults, or whether it be coming on Wednesday morning uh, you know, to the Bible study, or whatever event it may be taking place, I need time with God. The real question today is not do you attend church, But the real question is simply this, are you in love with Jesus? Think about it. Am I really in love with Jesus to where I want him more than even my next breath? Am I in love with Jesus so much that, you know, irregardless of what the week ahead may hold, am I so in love with him that I really don't care as long as I have Jesus by my side. I ask you this morning, is he your personal savior? And hear what I'm about to say. I I feel like one of the biggest mistakes that the 21st century church is making is that we are emphasizing the need of Jesus Christ as our savior, but we're not emphasizing the fact that we also need to make him our Lord. There's a difference. 
When Jesus Christ is merely my Savior, and don't get me wrong, I'm not downplaying that. I need him to be my Savior. He's the only one that can forgive me of my sins. I, I'm in complete agreement with that. But I can have him as my Savior and not my Lord. Because when he is my Lord, he has all of me. He's my boss, for want of a better way of putting it, to put it in everyday vernacular. He is my boss. He is my reason for living. He is my reason that when he instructs me to do something, I don't do it out of, of, of necessity. I don't do it out of the fact that I'm afraid that he might punish me if I don't. I do it because I love him. I am surrendering my will to his. He is my Lord. He is my master. You see, when he becomes my Lord... It puts a whole different perspective on my relationship with him. How many times have I been guilty? And perhaps you as well. Have I been guilty to going to the Lord in prayer and saying, God, give me this. God, do this. God, you know, uh, Lord, I, uh, your, your word says this and whatever. And, and God, I, I just expect it from you. In fact, I demand it from you rather than recognizing that he is God Almighty and he has given me the privilege as a child of God to enter into the throne room of heaven through the redemptive work of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross of Calvary. And it is now a privilege to go into him and ask him for certain things and whatever. But there's a difference between asking and demanding. And recognizing that he is Lord and I am his subject. I am his son. But I'm doing it with all due respect and not as a selfish individual going in and saying, God, you need to do this, you need to do that because I'm your child. Can you imagine your child walking into you on graduation day, saying, Mom and Dad, you know that I graduate today and uh, I expect that after the graduation ceremony that you hand me the keys to a brand new automobile. I'm your child. After all, you know, I've tolerated you for 18 years. Can you imagine what your reaction would be? But how many times am I like that with God? How many times are you like that with the Lord? Or let me put it in another way. I read this in John Bevere's book. It's not original with me, but I really liked it. He was talking about the fact of God being our Lord and not just our Savior. He said, suppose that you were dating, and since I'm a man... I was dating a very beautiful young lady. She not only was attractive, but she was smart. She was not only beautiful on the outside, but she was beautiful on the inside. She was charismatic. She was witty. We had a lot of things in common. We enjoyed being with each other and whatever. And finally, I proposed to her and asked her if she would spend the rest of her life with me. Would she be my wife? She enthusiastically responded, yes, and immediately my heart was filled to overflowing that this beautiful woman was going to spend the rest of her life with me. She said, yes, and after the enthusiasm had quieted down and my heart had quit pounding and racing, she said, but I have one stipulation, and that is this. I will love you as you've never been loved before. I will clean your house. I will do your dishes. I will bear your children. I will do this. I will do that. But one hour a year, I want to be free to go and spend time with my other lovers. What would your reaction be? Well, some of you already said, oh. But John continues on and he says, how many times do I try to hold something back from God? You see, as the church of God, we are the bride of Christ, are we not? When my wife accepted my proposal of marriage, and when she agreed to be my wife, we pledged to each other that we would forsake all others and cleave only unto one another. The two of us would become one flesh until death do us part. That means that even though there are other attractive women out here or whatever, Bonnie knows that my heart belongs to her. She knows that my love is given to her and her alone and not to someone else, not even for one hour a year. But how many times is it in your life and in mine we have something in our lives that we've put ahead of God and we've said, Lord, you're my spiritual husband. 
But this one thing, I'm holding back. How do you think that makes them feel? When I'm putting something else ahead of him, be it ever so insignificant as far as the time, but yet I'm allowing it to have priority over him. So I ask you, is he your personal savior? Is he the Lord of your life? You know, as humans, we have a tendency to run away from intimacy. We run from intimacy in relationships with our fellow man, our spouses, our children, and even God. And sadly, the very thing that will help us to be close to the Lord is the very thing that at times scares us away. But I'm so thankful that I can stand here before you this morning and relay to you that God is persistent. And thank God he doesn't give up easily. Can you say amen? amen? Friend, I submit to you that it's time to yield and be mature in our faith and develop a close relationship with God. God desires intimacy with all of us so that he can speak into our lives at all times. The second thing that we discover when we look at scripture about God is this. Not only does God desire intimacy, but he also desires truth. At all times, in all things. That's a good time to say amen. We need to get serious about what is going on in this world and what's going on in our own lives. Understand with me that one day we're all going to stand before Almighty God and give an account of our life. And even as I'm standing here today before, behind this pulpit saying that to you, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, I get a little nervous. One day, we all are going to stand before Almighty God and give an account of our lives. What if that were to take place within the next five seconds? Would you find yourself stuttering? Would you find yourself stumbling over words? Would you, uh, well, God, I, uh, well, I, I know I was doing that, but really, Lord, I, I, I really didn't mean to. And, and God, you know, you know my heart, you know? I mean, yeah, I got caught with my hand in the cookie jar, but God, you know, I wasn't going to take any. I was just going to take it and smell it. Come on. One day. And look, friends, it's not a time to play around with God in my relationship and your relationship. One day, we're all going to stand before the Lord and give an account of our lives. It's time to be real. It's time to start obeying his word in every area of our lives. Quite simply stated, quit dabbling in sin. Like my dad used to tell me when I was doing something that was wrong, quit it. Now, when my dad said it like that, I mean, he got my attention. I knew he wasn't playing games. I knew that he was serious. I knew that if I didn't quit it, there were going to be consequences. Now listen, God is a God of love. He's a God of grace. He's a God of mercy. But he also is a God that will one day be our judge. And today's church has forgotten that. We're great at emphasizing his love. We're great at emphasizing his forgiveness. We're great at emphasizing his mercy. And we're reluctant to talk about his judgment because that scares people away. And we're more interested in attracting numbers than we are in hearing from God. Sad but true, we live in a world that offers opinions that are not always godly. You know... The enemy is very tricky. He doesn't come right out and tell us to abandon God. He offers what seems to be good things that have a tendency to draw us away from the best thing, intimacy with God. And friend, I want to challenge you today. Quit settling for good when you can have best. It doesn't happen overnight, little by little. We find ourselves slowly slipping into trouble, slowly drifting away from the Lord. There's not a one of us here today that got up this morning and said, well, I think I'm going to backslide today, Bill. Not a one of you. 
It's little by little. Not having those intimate times with the Lord. Not having those times where you are allowing God to speak to you one-on-one. You've shut everything else out. And you have ears only to hear what the master is saying. The lesson to be learned is to watch the company that you keep. I ask you this morning, are there areas in your life that you're holding on to that you have not completely surrendered to God? Today would be a good time to lay them on the altar and release them over to the Lord once and for all. Friends, quit trying to do it in your own strength and allow the Holy Spirit to indwell you and understand the meanings of the word. It's not just a, a, a cute quoting of scripture when you say greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It is true. Greater is he that is in you. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the master of the entire universe. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And through his help and the enablement of his Holy Spirit, you can overcome any obstacle, anything that is laid claim to your life. Lay it on the altar, either literally or in a figurative sense. Lay it on the altar and surrender it to God today. Walk out of here in the freedom and the spirit and the liberty that Jesus Christ alone provides. I submit to you that it's time to be truthful with God. It's time to be truthful with yourself. It's time to hold nothing back. What happens in the heart is of great importance to our Heavenly Father. Oh, you can fool me. You can fool others. We can give the outward appearance that, man, I'm ready to Sprout wings and have a halo. When in reality, every morning I have to get up and dehorn myself. You see, the heart of humility is simply this obedience. The heart of humility is simply this obedience. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 9 tells us, as water reflects the face, so a man's heart reflects the man. Cleansing our hands, purifying our hearts, humbling ourselves are all part of drawing near to God. Too often we forget we are called to be the light of the world, but too many Christians have forgotten to turn their lights on. God speak. Speak to me, Lord. Speak to me, God. What are, you, what are you desiring to do with me today? What is it, God, that I need to lay on the altar? Come on, folks. What's God saying? What's he speaking? What changes need to take place that I can be drawn closer to him and keep close? The third thing that Scripture reveals is that God not only desires intimacy and God not only desires truth, but he also desires our time. If you desire to have a close relationship with God, you are going to have to invest time in it. If you'll not give him the time, then the truth of the matter is, God really doesn't have first place in my life or in yours. God offers his power, but that power comes through intimacy with him. If we have an intimate relationship with God... Wherever we go, the devil will flee. I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. My prayer is that every one of you who call HFA your church, that when you put your feet on the floor in the morning, that the demons will shudder and say to one another, Oh my, so-and-so is awake again and getting ready to go to work and to school and the store. And you know the havoc that they bring about on the kingdom of Satan when they're there because they're not ashamed of the gospel. They'll even lay their life down for this Jesus that they love, that they serve, that he's the master of their life. We're in trouble because they're awake again and they're going out spreading the good news that Jesus Christ is coming to seek and save that which is lost. That Jesus Christ has come to set the captive free. That Jesus Christ has come to give you life and life abundantly. That Jesus Christ has come to give you a future and a hope that leads to a good end. Friend, I remind you, look at how Jesus won every battle he faced. When you search the scripture that speak of Jesus' life, there is one thing that you'll always find. 
He made it a priority to spend time one-on-one with his heavenly father. He always made time. How many of you have difficulty spending regular quality fellowship time with the father? If we're truthful, probably every hand in this place would go up or close to it. Well, how is it possible? It's one thing to talk about, but how is it possible? Well, Paul gives us some insight in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, where he says, Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It's a deliberate action on my part where I'm recognizing I'm engaged in spiritual warfare. There's an enemy out here that's trying to rob me of God's best. There's an enemy out here that's trying to keep me from spending time with my father. There's an enemy out here who's trying to make me go around a spiritual weakling so that he can easily trip me up, cause me to fall flat on my face, cause me to get discouraged and give up on God. There's an enemy out here who has one agenda, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus Christ has come to give me life and life abundantly, and I'll choose Jesus every time over the devil. Listen, friends, the devil fights us hard. He does not want you. He does not want me to be in daily conversation with our Heavenly Father. And don't think that just because you listen to a gospel CD or you watch a pastor or a preacher on TV or you attend a Bible study, that that is your God time. It's not. It's good. It's supplemental. But listen to me. You need to come to God one-on-one so that he can give you an up-to-date revelation. I'm convinced that one of the biggest problems as a Christian in America is that we hear and we see so much that none of it gets down deep in our heart and in our mind. Come on now. We've been inundated. We've been flooded. We've been saturated to where, you know, we can quote scripture. We can go to this Bible conference. We can go to this evangelist meeting. We can watch this preacher on TV. We can even come to our home church and, and, and you know, hear sermons, and so on and so forth. But is it getting down where I really live? Is it producing change? Is it bringing about in my life what God is wanting to do? You see, any of those things in and of themselves many times do not impact our inner being. God is clear. You and I need to meditate on the times that he has conversations with us. Notice what the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What do I find myself thinking about? Well, if I'm not careful... I can find myself thinking about things that any Christian man should not be thinking. Because you see, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And if you don't have godly thoughts there, trust me, he'll fill them with something. Do you remember the story of Jesus visiting the home of his friend Martha and Mary? It's recorded in John chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. And I'm not going to take time to read it. But do you remember what Jesus told Martha was of the most importance? Remember how Martha came to Jesus and was complaining about her sister Mary? Lord, she's just plain being lazy. She's of no count. I mean, here you are, our honored guest in our home, and and, and I've been doing the dishes. I I cleaned house. I've been busy fixing the meal and whatever. And the whole time, that lazy, no good sister of mine has just been sitting at your feet listening to you talk. Now, what she was implying was this. Tell her to get up and tell her to pitch in and give me a hand. It's a lot of work. But what did Jesus tell her? Martha, you're worrying about things that, these are the, this is the Ferguson translation. You won't find it in the King James or New King James or NIV. Okay, this is the Ferguson translation. It hasn't been printed yet. But basically what he was saying was this. Martha, you worry about things that don't amount to a hill of beans. In the big picture. In the overhaul schemes things. Really doesn't matter. How clean your house is. Really doesn't matter. Whether or not everything is in place. Really doesn't matter how good the meal is. 
What matters is, have you spent time with me in my presence? And have you heard what I'm saying to you? We need to allow what we experience in God's presence to get down to where we really live. And not just have an understanding of it, but to allow it to become a revelation to where we incorporate it into our lives and it becomes a lifestyle, not just a good idea. There's much more I could say, but time's getting away. So let me wrap this up this morning. I want to encourage you this morning, friend. God has a personal plan for your life. He will give you the desires of your heart if you'll put forth the effort. I rehearse in your hearing again our text, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. The point that I'm making this morning in a nutshell is simply this. You have to give God time for him to speak. God, speak. Now listen, no discipline is ever joyous in the beginning. Anytime that you're producing change, you know what people are the most resistant to? Change. We get out of our routine. We get out of our comfort zone. We, we get out of, you know, the, the thing that has become a habit. And, you know, I, I, don't, I don't like change. No one likes change. But sometimes change is in my best interest. And if God is saying, Jeff, you need to change, and you put your name where I put mine, then how many of you would agree with me, we need to change? We need to have established boundaries in our life. Because having established boundaries in our life makes it easier to stay on course and to avoid detours. Intimate means to be involved and aware of every detail. God wants to be involved in every detail in your life and in mine. A mature relationship with God is refreshing and full of excitement, and it's time for you and I to quit shutting him out and allow God to speak. Because when I do, everything becomes sacred when God is in it. Everything becomes sacred when God is in it. I can go to the grocery store, and it can be a God moment, because I'm thinking of God. I can do something that I absolutely don't enjoy doing, but I enjoy being with my wife. So occasionally, I'm being honest, Bon. I know you thought I was going to lie for a moment. Occasionally, I will go with her shopping and not complain. I'm the typical American male. You know what you want before you go. You go to the store, you get it, you get out. My wife, on the other hand, she loves to compare prices. And she'll go to this store, and she'll go to that store, and she'll go to this store, and she'll go to that store, and she'll go to this store. And nine times out of ten, we'll end up back at the first store. But that's okay. Because she's price compared, and she's a smart shopper. And she really is. I just don't have the patience, and I don't have the forbearance, and whatever. I go, I get it, I come home. But everything, everything, hear me, my friend, everything that we do, everywhere that we go, becomes sacred when God is in it. St. Augustine said this, and I love it. To fall in love with God is the greatest romance to seek him the greatest adventure, to find him the greatest human achievement. I'm going to say that again. To fall in love with God is the greatest romance. 
to seek him their greatest adventure, to find him their greatest human achievement. And it's so true. There's a song that I haven't heard in a long, long time. Used to sing it when I was a youth growing up. In fact, I used to sing it as a special at church. I'm not going to sing it this morning because I want you to hang around for a few more minutes. But it's called A Brand New Touch. Will you allow me to just read in your hearing? I thought the sun had come to stay, but all too soon it went away. And in its place the storm clouds came, and with the clouds there came the rain. It rained so hard and oh so long. Beneath the storm I felt a calm. It was your touch that brought me through it all. Without your help I'd surely fall. The chorus is, Lord, you know I need a brand new touch. My strength from yesterday is gone. But if you'll give me, Lord, another touch, I'll have the strength to carry on. But it matters not what comes my way, Lord, if you'll just touch me new each day. Your loving touch drives all my fears away. Close by your side, I want to stay. Lord, you know how weak I really am. Oh, even better than myself. But with your help, I know I really can make it through the darkest night. Everything's going to be all right. Lord, you know I need a brand new touch. That's me this morning. How about you? My strength from yesterday is gone. But if you'll give me, Lord, just one more touch... I'll have the strength to carry on. On your insert in your bulletin, the fill in the blank, turn it over. I have one more sermon to do in this series. But I want to just ask you to take just a few moments right now. Look at these three verses. The one in the middle, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 46.10. That's the scripture that we used the Sunday that we spoke, God speak. The next one is found in Ezekiel 22:30, there at the bottom. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. And then today's text is there at the top. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. What are those verses saying to you? I, I mentioned that I felt like today was going to be different. And I really feel as though God is wanting you and me as a church family to experience a spiritual breakthrough. But it begins by a willingness on your part and on mine to come and either literally or figuratively lay it on the altar. And today I want to give you an opportunity. Look, you don't have to identify what it is to me. You don't have to identify what it is to God. But I'm going to ask you one by one if you are feeling like the Lord is telling you to come to the altar and lay something down there, that you come, place your hand on the altar, lay it there. You're welcome to stay at the altar if you feel the need to. But if not, then just go ahead and come up. Like I said, place your hand on the altar and you can go ahead back to your seat right away. Or if you want to linger for a few moments and pray silently and go back, I want to do that for a few moments. But as you're there in your seat today, I want you to look at those three scripture verses and I want you to begin 
to just shut yourself in with God and say, God, speak. Come on, do that. I can't force you, but I'm asking you to as your friend, as your pastor, because I believe that God's speaking today. I believe God's challenging some of you today. And like I said, this is just your one-on-one time with the Lord. God, speak. If you've got something that you need to come and lay down on this altar, that's what it's here for. Come and lay it down. As Benny and Maisie sang earlier, you'll find me sitting at the Master's feet. Can't think of a better place to be than at the Master's feet. This is your time with God. It's not for you to identify yourself to me or anybody else. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. Remember a couple weeks ago I told you there's only one opinion that matters? God's. It's all that matters. If you're not walking as close to Him as what you need to be walking, there's no better time than to start right now. I'm going to be quiet for just a few moments while we meditate and allow God to speak to us.